Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Justina Eitzinger, and I am the Chief Operating Officer at Images Retail Middle East. It is my honor and utmost pleasure to welcome our distinguished speakers and over 500 of you who've joined us today at Zoom and YouTube for our very first amongst a series of virtual roundtables. At Images Retail Middle East, our mission is crystal clear. We wish to be the number one retail intelligence and knowledge sharing platform. And so here we are. I hope each one of you benefits from today's discussions and takes away a positive learning. Quarter one of this year brought with it some rather unprecedented times. In order to contain the rapid spread of COVID-19, governments in the Middle East and the world over had to implement lockdowns, restrict movement, close shopping malls, and carry out the necessary sterilization and social distancing initiatives. Almost all brick and mortar retailers got severely affected in the process. None of us anticipated this and none of us were prepared adequately for it. But all of us dealt with it and we continue to deal with it. This pandemic has given us a crash course on crisis management. It has gotten us fully digital at record speed we are functioning virtually almost 100% of the time. From no shaking hands to maintaining a two meter distance between colleagues, customers, friends, it's heartbreaking, but it is the new normal. A little bit about the UAE economy. Our GDP was approximately 1.464 trillion dirhams in 2019 and grew by 1.7% from 2018, as per IMF. 27% of the GDP of UAE is acknowledged to have come from retail industry, and almost 22% of the country's workforce were employed by the retail industry. Therefore, when the retail industry suffers, it's inevitable that both the people and the economy do too. But the good news is the government's initiatives have heat success and the rate of spread has reduced. The region is also among the first few globally to announce effective and carefully planned reopening in a phased approach. Last week, we saw UAE open up shopping malls, high streets, physical retail stores and restaurants, but amidst guidelines. There's a big responsibility with retailers today to ensure the safety of their customers and people. We must learn fast, there's a lot to be done, and we need to catch up on time lost. Is it going to be easy? Not at all. It has become imperative that we realign our business critical goals, engage with our customers more, collaborate with our partners and take care of our human capital. Our speakers today come from various walks of retail. They are leaders and bear the flag for the retail industry. Let's learn from them. I would now like to welcome to the floor my dear colleague, Rup Katabhaumek, who will start and moderate the session with these amazing leaders. Over to you, Rup. Thank you. Thank you, Justina, for the beautiful conversation starter. And indeed, we have a stellar panel of speakers uh, here today with us who will share their experiences and learnings from quite an unprecedented crisis. Of course, uh, COVID-19 has uh, challenged businesses uh, in a way never seen before um, and reshaped consumption patterns. Uh, on that note, a very warm welcome to our panelists uh, representing uh, the full spectrum from shopping malls to different retail businesses. Uh, we have with us Mark Tessman, CEO Liva, Enter uh, Liva Trading Enterprises, representing uh, a plethora of uh, franchised and homegrown businesses, including the likes of Gantt, Aspinall of London, 
dwell among others. We have uh, from the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, Marwan Mukarzil, CEO of Fawaz A. al Hoker and Company, again representing some much loved brands like Zara, Mango, Gap, to Costa. From the shopping mall uh, industry, we have Timothy Ernest, who handles um, an excellent portfolio of uh, brands uh, under the Festival City uh, brand and the most recent uh, Festival Plaza that opened in Dubai across uh, markets like UAE, Qatar, and North Africa. We have hospitality veteran Naeem Madad behind uh, some award-winning concepts like Reform Social and Grill, Folly by Nick and Scott, among others. As Chief Communications Officer, V. Nanda Kumar represents uh, marketing and communications uh, operations for Lulu Group International across 16 markets. That's our stellar panel for today, and we are expecting um, a very, very, uh, we are expecting to touch upon diverse topics and learn from their experiences and hear, hear their insights. Uh, so why don't we begin with uh, how the pandemic has actually transformed your businesses? How have you had to actually pivot to ensure resilience for a new tomorrow? Should we begin with your thoughts, Timothy? Uh, our business uh, is very public facing. Uh, if you look at malls, they're especially in the Middle East, certainly in Dubai, we build them very big for a lot of people. So uh, when the crisis hit and your business is shut down, as some others have uh, in this group today too, uh, it requires a, a very different approach than a lot of the other crises that, that we've had. I mean, we're, we've got our doors closed. Uh, so what we did, number one, is, is protect the welfare of our employees. Uh, this is a crisis that has a lot of very unusual elements to it that we haven't had to face before. A lot of the crises before have been more financial, balance sheet, access to capital, things like that. This is a, a, you know, a pandemic. Very much everybody in the world is impacted. So uh, we look out for the welfare of the employees. And then the second thing we did right away uh, is to look at our, our primary customer, who's our retailers, knowing that the buildings are shut down. So we became very clear very quickly of the types of uh, partnership we would, we would have with them during this period of time, uh, because you know we want to, to look at long-term business continuity. So uh, we administered uh, immediate rent reductions uh, almost to all 1,400 tenants that we've had. So, very dramatic impact for us. We call this stage one when we're closed, uh, with stage two is when we open under a restricted environment. So, so very dramatic impact, but, but one, I think quick decision-making, concise decision-making and dealing with facts and making sure you communicate closely with your customers and look out for your employee welfare. I mean, that's really the basic things you, you had to do during this initial stage. Thank you, Timothy. Can we hear um, your perspectives from KSA, Marwan? How have you dealt with the situation? Um, all right, so I guess we went through the phases of, you know, at the beginning it was a shock, definitely for everybody. It was something unexpected. Then we went into the, the, the response mode. Uh, the one thing I would say is that the first response was definitely not knowing how long this um, this crisis will take. So it was uh, it was definitely a cash game. So so cash is king again. So that was the first reaction. Second, it was about how to protect our people and customers and make sure that we keep on communicating. So a lot was done at the beginning when it comes to the people side. Um, but definitely keeping the people motivated. Uh, so communication was key. What I, what, what I call, you know, or what they call in leadership being the lover at this stage. But then we moved into the, the dreamer and the thinker part. And what I mean by that, I would say, okay. as retail, the one thing that, that we have experienced is that we are late and we were late into jumping to the omni-channel uh, world. 
so we all spoke about it a lot in the Middle East, but I guess we were all in a way or another complacent or in a way a bit lazy. And we were laid back because offline is huge, at least in Saudi. And I guess the one, the one good thing I can take away is that it has pushed us, all of us, the whole team to learn, to learn fast, uh, to jump into, into the marketplaces. So today in no time, we actually increased our uh, uh, online sales by 700%. Wow. Is this the right number? Is this too little? Is this too much? I don't know. The one thing I know, we've learned a lot. We've reacted. Uh, I personally learned a lot during this crisis because it's unprecedented. Um, it just, one thing I have definitely transformed and the organization has transformed is the, is the mindset of shifting investments going forward. I would say definitely we have to revisit our investments. Where should we go? How big should we go? Which brands should we take? I think there will be consolidation. And again, how much should you uh, move to the online space? Um, it's a different ball game. It's probably what we should have been uh, three, four years from now, and it was just uh, brought backwards, I would say. So uh, um, we, I can say we are somehow now in the situation of Europe and the US probably a year or two ago. The only thing I am, I am always optimistic about is that we are uh, social animals, and definitely when it comes to Saudi in particular, I would say the, the, the one entertainment remains malls, remains shopping. Um, so we are definitely going to bounce back. How fast we will discuss maybe at a later stage today. But definitely online is there to stay. So omni-channel is not, is not anymore a nice to have, but a must have. Absolutely. Um, on that note, um, how long did it take for you to bring your brands online? Okay, and did so you bring all your brands online? Uh, good question. Um, no, actually, let me put it this way. We were already trading in few uh, platforms, uh, which are the mono brands like Zara, Zara Home, and Massimo Dutti. The one thing that, that was, uh, I would say, uh, into rapid mode, we moved into rapid mode, is uh, placing our products on marketplaces, and that's no secret to share. So today we trade on Noon, we trade on Namshi, we trade on Mom's World, we trade on Souk uh, okay. as of yesterday. So I would say, let me put it this way, just to be optimistic, I am enjoying and the team is enjoying this phase because we're learning a lot and we're testing. I would say the best way to look at it is that it's a testing mode now. We're actually even uh, gonna launch our own, uh, I would say, uh, landing site uh, in 10 days from now. Uh, we have uh, got a lot of support from all our franchisors to acquire the exclusive rights for Saudi and the other markets we operate. They've been very supportive. I, I, I just think at the end, there was no choice because we didn't know when we will reopen. Uh, thanks God, we, we reopened on Wednesday. Um, but again, I guess uh, uh, we had to rush things that we should probably have done earlier. But again, I guess this is, this is, this is the, um, it is what it is. Um, but now I can say in a way or another, I would say our online has, has reached around 15 to 18% of our sales, which is interesting, but let's see um, how we can come up. I am worried about the customer experience that we can provide. And I think this is our challenge now. And it's all about how we can acquire the right competencies now needed and from a team perspective to manage such a new dimension. Uh, so it wasn't new to us, but definitely it has multiplied. Sure, thank you so much. Moving on to you, Mark. Can you please share your thoughts? Sure, of course. Um, well, I mean, uh, the world changes very quickly, doesn't it? I mean, I think if I look back at the start of the year, we were extremely optimistic and we were thinking about uh, having one of our best years in recent times. So January and February were actually great for us. We were, we were uh, well up on our budgets. And then um, obviously COVID came along and uh, obviously our first thoughts were to our, uh, our store colleagues and, uh, and our customers. So we took all the appropriate action that we needed to do at that, uh, at that time. So then obviously the, the almighty collapse, you know, has, uh, and it's been quite disastrous, obviously, in terms of the impact on our, uh, on our overall business. So I think the first thing that we did was obviously think about, similar to Marlon, it's where you can position yourself to actually, you know, optimize what's left of your business in a, you know, because obviously country by country, the, the dynamic was very, was very different. So um, I think allowing our 
we actually empowered our people in all our individual countries to obviously make those decisions that they had to on the ground. And I think we were very quick in terms of doing uh, some of the things that we did. But to go from you know, making reasonable revenues to making no revenues, you're then into a management scenario of, um, with all your vendors and your suppliers and so on and so forth, because uh, obviously uh, the um, trading element to disappear so rapidly makes uh, it makes a massive difference to your um, sort of relationships that you've got with some of your uh, individual clients, like I said. So once that's been done, I think the route that we've taken with everybody has just been very open and honest and frank to say, we've, for example, we've already said to a lot of our suppliers, we're not going to be paying them till June, because at least if they uh, know exactly where they stand, they can manage accordingly and so on and so forth. We've had to, we've had to take that stance. With our colleagues as well, you know, we, um, you know, we've taken actions in terms of, Yes, we've had to take on popular decisions like everybody has in terms of salaries and so on and so forth. And we've deferred salaries uh, by 20% for, for one of the months, uh, for April. And then we're gonna continue to review that as we're going forward. But um, I think in terms of trying to get sales moving again, we also looked at our digital elements to see what we could do and what we couldn't do. Um, we've launched Dwell, for example, but it's only taken us two and a half weeks to get that online. I mean, Amazing. One, of the other, one of the other brands that we, uh, we took a, a much much longer stance um or longer um, approach to try and get that one uh, stabilized and we took six months to get that done so when we launched gant it took six months when we launched well it's taken two and a half weeks so it's it's amazing what you can do when you're backs to the wall and you have to think differently uh, about doing some sort of rapid response to uh, you know the required trading requirements um and the other thing that we've now been able to do is think about our longer term view it's really made us refocus on the uh, on, on the total business so we've done a strategic review of all our brands while the bit while the uh, stores have been uh, closed it's very clear that some of the brands have been more resilient than others so if i'm i'm actually been amazed by the performance of our home brands we've got two home brands one called dwell and one called simply simply kitchen um and whilst people have been at home it's amazing that they've obviously been looking at their own surroundings and thinking well, I need th new things here and new things there. So those two brands have actually done very well. And we've been trading on Instagram, for example, because we didn't have platforms for those. So we were you know, just improvising a little bit about what we could and what we couldn't do. Uh, so we think that, uh, and they're wholly um, owned brands by us, they're not franchises. So I think that's been critical for us to make sure that we are gonna push on with the development of those brands. And I think own brands uh, are the way forward in, uh, in, in my view for the moment, because I think at least you're in control of your own destiny. I think the thing that's unknown for us in the medium term is what um, our franchise relationships are going to be because we're getting new news all the time from our franchise partners about problems they've got on supply chain, the fact that they're quite crudely cancelling forward orders and so on and so forth, which means if I'm looking at the balance of our year, then we're almost in doing reforecasts on a daily basis at the moment. So. And you don't really want to be doing that. You want to have a, um, you know, a spread of numbers that you think can look reasonable so you can plan against those. So I think um, the operational piece on a day-to-day -day basis is going to be a challenge for the next few months because it's changing literally by the minute. The longer strategic piece, I think we're pretty comfortable in terms of where we want to be. But there's one thing that is definitely for sure is that the, we, our business will probably be smaller as a result this year. As We were planning originally a 20% growth uh, this year for all the plans that we've got laid down um, and we were on track like I said I think we're now probably going to end up with a 20% smaller business than we did in 2019 just by the if you lose a quarter of sales then you know that's uh, you know that's just going to where, you, where, where you're going to end up so you've got to make sure that you've got a brand portfolio and a strategy for those brands that actually can survive towards the end of the year and I think survival mode is very much what everybody's thinking about at the moment. Sure sure thank you uh, Naeem, can we move over to you? Could you give us your perspectives from the hospitality industry? Yes, certainly. It, it's, been, it's been a challenge, uh, not to um, regurgitate what my colleagues have been saying, but I think the first six weeks of 20, 2020 were um, amazing. Sentiments were extremely positive and we saw a, a trend that was going certainly in the right direction. Uh, nonetheless, uh, February, the last week of Feb onwards, We've, uh, we've seen a, an industry that's really come to an end on the hospitality uh, front. Um, unlike my colleagues, again, I think our industry is very intimate. There's some kind of um, 
direct impact because basically the industry has been stripped from anything that um, is first-hand experience be it uh, the, the dining in venues being staying in hotels uh, the airlift the airlines uh, all of these came to a, a very sudden halt so principally the industry has has been crippled um, i foresee the next 12 18 months of being an amazing challenge for the industry i think uh, even though i think there will be a lot of lax rules and regulations coming into play i think social confidence will be the biggest challenge moving forward how do you embed that back into people and, and get people to come out and, and uh, go back to some kind of old norm as, as we know it. Uh, I think there'll be a lot of um, new questions, new, uh, new, new rules, new norms coming out of the equation, um, not forgetting that um, everybody across the board, no matter what industry you're, you're working, has been impacted from revenues, from a payroll scale, lack of revenue, losing jobs um, and the like. So I think there will be a a paradigm shift generally uh, and we have to adjust to it fairly quickly principally what we have been able to do very quickly due, based on the size of the organization is uh, really we've gone back to our four brand pillars very quickly saying what are they innovate enrich engage belong and we've applied all of those online so the homeschooling that we're doing on our own website uh, is, is amazing so we've taken industry professionals who have come on onto the, um, the stage, so to speak, and in Latin, um, some kind of a topic industry related. We have also uh, taken the experience of our own restaurants into people's homes, be it bingo, be it quiz nights, um, food in, the, in their own homes. Uh, we, we fully understand that we're not delivering the full experience. We, we're short on the experience because we can't execute that in someone's house. We can't have larger groups. You can't mix and mingle. Uh, nonetheless, the communication part from our end is is really the, the main decision that I've taken, said to myself and my team, let's move forward, let's stay with the brands very much in everyone's fore, forefront and, and make sure that we represent the industry as a whole to to stay connected. Uh, commercially, it's, it's not viable by any stretch. Uh, whatever we're doing is, is, is not sufficient to, to maintain the business. But this is where I'm hoping that the industry or multiple industries and every stakeholder will unite, be it uh, financial institutions, be it landlords, uh, banks, uh, ministries, multiple uh, stakeholders all come together and shoulder uh, certain responsibilities for survival, nothing else, until, the, until all of the economy kicks back in and then we have clarity on the vaccine uh, for, for the virus. So we have some kind of confidence in people's mind to say, Let's re-engage and let's reconnect with, with our uh, social lives. Thank you. Uh, Nanda Kumar, how has your experience been through the pandemic? Different, of course, because uh, you represent the uh, essential sector, grocery retail. Could you please share with us your perspectives? Could you please unmute? Yeah, sorry, yeah. can you hear me with Katha now? Yes, clearly. Thank you. I mean, as you rightly said, grocery and supermarkets were among the very few businesses who were operating, you know, apart from the medical and health sectors. Yeah. Uh, because pandemic or no pandemic, lockdown, no lockdown, people need to eat and they need essentials, correct? So we knew the food security is no more a business for us. It's going to be a responsibility and it's a duty, national duty for that. And obviously the two biggest challenges we had were sourcing and filling our shelves and keeping our stores safe for both customers and our employees. Mm -hmm. And you know, keep in mind, there were no precedences. I mean, there were no best practices to refer. We, in fact, formed, a, I remember the first day when this whole thing broke up, broke out in this country, we formed a very high level core committee, in fact, led by our chairman, Mr. Yusufali himself, to ensure uninterrupted procurement and supply of products, you know, and working very closely with various government authorities and, uh, and other stakeholders. The core team took over, in fact, the whole, whole, whole operations. They put in motion a fast track policy, so to say, you know, to do away the slightly cumbersome regular systems of procurement and operations. I mean, talking directly to brand leaders and their leaderships, manufacturers, in fact, chartering cargo planes daily to fly in fruits and vegetables and other essential perishable commodities from around the world. You know, and, and imagine managing logistics in a restricted movement scenario is very, very challenging. 
I mean, I mean, hats off to the procurement team and operation team. I mean, not just of Lulu Group only. I mean, all the supermarkets, all the all the stakeholders in the industry, they did an amazing job. I mean, thanks to this effort, you can see there's actually total stability in the market. No situation of panic buying or empty shelves, unlike you would have noticed, you know, seen in some of the visuals which coming out of from other countries. I mean, obviously, that was the biggest thing to make sure product in our shelves and in our warehouses. The next challenge was obviously to maintain as we're working, you know, to maintain a safe and healthy environment for our staff and our, for our customers, obviously. The first step was to build confidence, you know, among the customers and staff. So apart from implementing the basic hygiene protocols, such as providing free masks and gloves and sanitizers, thermal scanners were installed, sanitizing various touch points, but we then started doing deep cleaning and sterilization of our stores and warehouses in a scheduled manner, working very close with uh, government agencies to do so. Uh, we started communicating more, you know, mm. both with our employees and with the community to inform the steps we were taking and also to dispel many myths and fake news during the rounds. You know, obviously, you know that social media is both is both boon and a bane. Initial days, it was mayhem, you know, with all kinds of rumors, myths basically too much of news but thanks to leadership of this great country and situation was never out of hand and it is one of the most stable countries in the world today so a big round of applause to the retail heroes i must say who are ensuring that they have that we have food on our tables every day so to say this has very few things uh, as as somebody who was working as an industry which is working throughout this uh, pandemic there are many learnings, you know, many things, many myths which we had in our life about the way people shop, the way people perceive shopping to be have been have been totally laid to rest. Uh, as we go forward, we'll definitely share some more views. But challenges were procurement and safety both were mm -hmm. kind of met. That's what people have been happy here. All right. All right. On that note, we move on to um, reopening of uh, retail stores, high streets, commercial centers. Uh, big news from last week. So it'll be great to know uh, how you all have coped. Timothy, uh, starting with you first, how have you assured uh, shoppers that uh, shopping mall is a safe place to come back to now? How are you bringing them through your doors, especially when uh, entertainment uh, is not operational yet? Yeah, we're, we, we have opened um, uh, two of our properties in Dubai opened uh, about uh, seven days ago, eight days ago. Uh, we have uh, a property that actually never closed completely in Cairo uh, and then uh, some other properties that haven't opened. But uh, I, I think we, we've done it in partnership uh, very closely uh, with the government and by opening our properties. They have put together a, a very good uh, working retail committee as to, hey, what does a mall look like when it opens initially? What does a retail operation look like? Uh, when it opens initially. So we were able to, for, for several weeks prior to opening, really talk through and work through what the appropriate way to do this uh, in a way that's going to promote uh, definitely customer safety, but also uh, put together a, a type of situation where retailers could open into business as well and, and uh, employees could feel safe. So with all that said, uh, we spent several weeks preparing uh, so what's different about a mall today than, than two months ago uh, is number one, instead of uh, maybe 50 or 60 entrances in your average mall, some malls have over 100 entrances, uh, we have uh, dedicated only seven to eight of our entrances to open to actually bring the public in uh, because we want to bring them in at very much control points. Uh, so with that said, we can monitor uh, ensuring that they're following the safety guidelines of masks. Uh, and we can also check, we have thermal cameras, uh, which check temperature. So we don't have to get up close to you to check the temperature. We can see on a thermal camera, which tells us very quickly. Uh, we also have taken steps to uh, very much uh, improve, or let's say increase our, our cleanliness from the standpoint of sanitization. Uh, we're limited to 30% capacity. 
So what that means is, is what our capacity on an hourly basis for a building, uh, we're limited to just 30% of that. So we have steps in place to make sure that we don't exceed that. And then once you're there, we have steps in place to make sure that you maintain proper social distancing. Uh, as you can imagine, there was some pinned up demand uh, for the first few days. So a couple stores in particular had lines and things like that that we had to, to carefully manage and, and also introduce some, some applications in which appointments could be made for, for stores that uh, we have lines. So it's been a very sensitive time. I would like to impress upon everybody that we've opened the malls and that's, that's where we want to be. We want to get back to where our doors open. But we're under a very restricted guideline uh, 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 presence. So uh, we, we really can't make a lot of judgments today uh, as to what we're seeing other than seeing maybe in the future uh, some steps that might be more permanent, some steps that might be more temporary in nature. Uh, for example, probably one of the biggest things uh, other than 30% uh, restricting uh, footfall uh, within your properties is there's age restrictions of no one uh, under 12 or actually no one between the ages of three and 12 uh, and no one over 60, which I was uh, very upset the other day. I actually got carded at a mall that I visited. So uh, I, I, I forgot that they were uh, looking for IDs and I figured out, oh, they must think I'm close to 60. But anyway, uh, the biggest impact is the children. I mean, malls are placed for families, and kids, and quite frankly, kids make most of the judgments of which malls you go to and how long you stay. So, uh, but, I, but I think it was the proper thing to do. Uh, you don't wanna open the malls and, and you have large, large footfall and, and, and people uh, you know, want to come but feel uncomfortable and it's, it's a negative situation. So I think it was done properly. And I, I think very soon you'll see more and more of some of the guidelines eased. Uh, and then we'll be able to, to really look at what are some of the longer term trends that we'll see right now again we don't make too many judgments because again the, the high level guidelines that we have sure thank you um moving over to um the fashion retailers marwan and mark how has uh, the reopening shaped up for uh, you both because fashion is uh, discretionary spending for consumers. How are you re-strategizing to meet uh, changed consumption patterns, consumer behavior? All right, um, let me start by saying by, uh, first of all, we were extremely excited and happy to see that we were able to reopen. So we opened our street locations uh, on Sunday which gave us, uh, I would say, some learning curve until the malls reopened on Wednesday. The challenge is the opening times, as, as you know, due to the curfew. So it's nine to five. So practically, you can open the mall from 10 to four. So you, you get in customers by between 10 and four. The first thing that, that we have done is to give confidence to our people to come and attend to the stores. So we had to go through the communication part of it. Uh, sanitization, uh, masks, gloves. I, I don't want to repeat what Timothy uh, yeah. mentioned, but these are the basics that should be there, apparent and actual. Uh, definitely a lot of work has been done with the landlords hand in hand to give comfort to, to the, uh, I would say, shoppers. Uh, definitely the sister company, Arabian Centers, which is one of the biggest players here, has done a lot of uh, ads on Instagram and the other uh, platforms to give comfort. So first, we have to give comfort so that people come, whether our yeah. people or customers. Second, um, it was about being prepared. So again, uh, it was uh, a race against time to get the stores up and running. Um, I would say, uh, let me tell you a little bit about my experience because I visited stores and I visit every day. Um, and this is what could be of interest to our participants today is that there are very serious buyers in the malls now. So let's say that the traffic is around 30% of what it should be. But if you extrapolate the numbers a little bit, it means that we are as good or even a little bit better, same timings last year, same days during Ramadan. This is normal because people know there are no other times to come, but given you know the culture and it's, a, it's the holy month of Ramadan, it's a bit challenging, but still we are seeing serious buyers walking into the malls. 
Um, one thing for sure, uh, just to answer you properly, we're not going to go into a promotion game. I don't think it makes sense um, as long as you have your inventories at the right levels. Uh, I actually think this is a great time for retailers to put, put more emphasis on customer service rather than anything else. It comes with challenges. The challenges that we are facing uh, are actually, there are no refund and exchange policies now. You cannot, and you cannot even try your clothes on because fit fitting rooms are not allowed. So when we were so excited to get fitting rooms in into Saudi, now they are you know, not available anymore. But what we're telling our customers is that we're saying, uh, when the government uh, and the Ministry of Health allows uh, re refund and exchange, we're gonna extend that and we're gonna be very flexible with our customers. So to encourage them and give them that comfort. Um, other, other than that, I would say click and collect has helped. So we gave the option for those who'd like to pick the products from the malls, knowing that, uh, you know, very transparently, we had a lot of challenges and delays in delivering products on time to customers due to curfew and uh, I guess the big volume, uh, you know, challenge on, uh, on uh, you know, the last mile. Um, the last thing I want to say is that even sales, without divulging much information as a listed company, even sales are actually encouraging. Uh, I, this is the experience I've had in Saudi. I don't know about the Dubai market, but sales have been a little bit even better than what we would have expected in such a period of time. I would say people are, I can see it when I, when I visit, they're getting used to it. Unfortunately, that's the new normal. Um, uh, you know, it's it could be it, it could feel like uh, you know three weeks ago when you used to go to the supermarket. It's an adventure by itself, and now the malls uh, also. Uh, I'm glad that I see some malls. Uh, I'm not sure whether Timothy mentioned they are adding the the machines, the sanitizing machines. I think it's a lot. It's a lot to do with giving comfort to your shoppers. Uh, I'm positive that things will come back to normal. But it's going to take some time, definitely. Uh, challenging times. I can say challenging times. But again, it's all about people this time. This time, it's really about people uh, trying to serve best your customer and trying to give you know the best experience and journey in, inside the store. Because that's 30% of the, the usual flow that you get into the store. That is quite optimistic, actually. 30%? that you have clocked uh, better sales compared to uh, the same period last year. Yeah, you're, you're comparing six hours this year of trading during Ramadan yeah. versus six last year. So if yes. you look at total LFLs, it definitely doesn't look good. If you look at those particular six hours versus the last year's same six hours, you're as good or even a bit better. But again, there is, uh, I would say some, uh, you know, it's, it's a bit... Uh, skewed here because this is the only time you can shop sure sure, sure. but again it gives some some sense of uh, i would say hope again i am a big believer that and this is as you mentioned this is without cinemas without fnbs yes. without any entertainment without kids even in saudi below 15 so it's mainly the female uh, you know walking into the mall getting what needs to be bought and moving back okay. you know uh, uh, fast okay Okay. Mark, over to you. Uh, well, our experiences are very similar to Marwan's, of course, in terms of getting stores up and running. Um, I think one of the biggest challenges we had was clearly trying to get all the staff tested for COVID-19, as were the, uh, the regulations trying to get everybody back into uh, the, the stores. And that took some time. So, um, you know, mobilizing your workforce and moving around to the various uh, testing stations and things was, uh, was a challenge, uh, but the team did a great job to get all that done. So, I mean, that was a job well done for them. I think we've noticed some really interesting dynamics since uh, the stores have started trading again. So we've only got a couple of um, stores that don't sit in shopping malls. So for example, we've got a standalone unit in Alain um, where that's 200% up on last year and has been trading like that for the last two weeks because there's so much pent up demand. You know, I think people have been you know, desperate to get out and do something. So I think you kind of you kind of seen that dynamic a, a little bit. There's still clearly concerns amongst people about wanting to go out and uh, and be too close to other people I think, until they've got some level of comfort from you know, the government in terms of communication, in terms of about the uh, the numbers of uh, increasing infections and so on and so forth. The other thing that we've seen quite clearly is that the more let's call them more local malls that are sit in communities, they've done much much better. So uh, again, because I don't think people are prepared to travel the big distances to go to some of the bigger malls. 
Um, I was in Dubai Mall, for example, on Thursday, which obviously is a powerhouse mall in terms of what it does for us as a business. Um, you know, I could have I could have shot a gun down the aisle and not hit anybody. It was uh, it was that bad. You know, there was there's literally nobody nobody there. Quite quite interesting to see. So I think with the lack of you know tourism numbers and things like that, for I think Dubai will be affected slightly differently. But I think those uh, major um, tourist centres that have got retail within them will will take some longer time to uh, to recover. Um, but the local malls are um, you know are um, a little bit better protected, I think, because people will go to their local proximity to do a bit of shopping. I think the other thing that I've got to do is thank all our store teams because when we actually had to rapidly close down our, our stores, then we were actually in sale at the time. Um, so there was a massive job of work for the store teams when they went back into the stores to demount sale, re-merchandise the stores, change the layouts, put new product in, you know, and generally make the stores look as they should for uh, the current trading environment. No promotions are allowed and so on and so forth. So percentage wise, I'm seeing for some phenomenal um, sort of uh, margin numbers from a percentage perspective, but of course the overall sales volumes are, are pretty sad. The reality of life is from a trading perspective, from a P&L perspective, you know, we're probably losing more money now than we were when we were shut, if that makes any sense whatsoever. Um, but that will gradually change over time and you have to start at, uh, you have to start at some, some, some point. So um, I think we're just keeping a really weather eye on what's happening um, day by day in terms of which markets are recovering um, and how we're now thinking about having to change our merchandise assortment because a strong performing store what would, that would have been in the plan you know, kind of a year ago when we set the merchandise plans will now not necessarily be the same. So we've got to be very adapt. We've got to be um, uh, adept, sorry, and very quick at changing our trading stance to those malls that are actually going to do very well compared to those ones that aren't. So managing our stock and our inventory uh, is uh, a primary focus for our merchandising teams. And of course, that's another interesting dynamic for us because we're trying to, we've got all, a lot of people working from home. You know, we've got a very skeleton staff here in the office. So it's been interesting to see that dynamic of people working, whether it be through Microsoft Teams or what are they were doing to, you know, to get work done, agreed, and get in actions. Uh, and funnily enough, I, I have to say, I think some of the decision making has probably been faster under the process of managed uh, meetings under those forums than it may well have been in an ordinary enough office environment. So that's been a, actually a, a very strange positive as a result of the uh, the current problems. Thank you. Moving over to you, uh, Naeem, a recent KPMG report uh, estimates that there's been a 30% to 80% decline in F&B sales um, in March and during the lockdown period. How are you strategizing to bring uh, your diners back into the restaurants in a safe manner? Yeah, look, we, we, we're not alone. And I think the KPMG report, you know, the 80% drop is, is probably too timid as well. I think a, a lot of us have been hit a lot harder than, than 80%. Um, places are closed, let's, let's be honest. Um, yeah. So strategy to bring people into the place. I, I think we're, we're moving prematurely. I think with 560 new cases today announced, um, I think we're moving too rapid. We still don't have sufficient confidence, sufficient uh, measures in place to, to say we, we are okay. So I'm hoping we're not trading too too fast um, in order to bring people back. Obviously, uh, regulations for food and beverage, uh, hospitality in general, 30% um, capacity, which means principally 10% because all of a sudden with the heat now escalating fast, you're losing all your outdoor spaces. Um, having to close by 10 p.m. for the curfew, um, limitations on certain uh, beverages, uh, service of beverages, limitations on shisha, under age um, of 12 is not permitted, over age of 60 is not permitted. Uh, so principally, the, the entire experience has been stripped from any potential life that we do in food and beverage. Um, to top it all up, you, you, you have to use uh, plastic, uh, cutlery, crockery, glassware, uh, all disposables. Um, our own teams are walking around with masks and gloves. So the experience that's been, that people actually come out for has been stripped away. So there's really very little for people to come out. And with the services of deliveries and the aggregators being in place, I think a lot of people are opting to stay at home and making sure that they, they, keep, they keep their distance uh, until 
there, there's clarity out there on the virus, uh, vaccines, and the, the, the safety issue in total. All right. Nanda Kumar, uh, you have seen some massive changes in consumption patterns. Uh, would you like to touch upon that? Uh, there, there has been no reopening in your case, but uh, changes certainly. Would you want to point uh, some of the changes out to us? Yeah, obviously, as a given, you know, health and safety products as such as hand sanitizers, face masks, gloves are the leaders in the category, along with personal care and home care products, paper products, oral care products. But obviously, downfall is garments, electronics, and other lifestyle products, which went down, obviously, mm -hmm. except for laptops and accessories, you know, thanks to the work from home and study from home scenario. People are nowadays, we notice that eating from home a lot. So we see an uptake of related product categories. Grocery basket sizes have gone up, you know, as the frequency of visits have come down. So people are buying more at, at a particular trip rather than trying to come quite often to the store. Uh, we also, to, to, to help them out, we also came up with, you know, essential kits uh, to ensure that they have quicker and uh, convenient shopping faster. And going forward, we all have to seriously look at realigning the operations, uh, the product mixes, the store layout, our buying patterns, everything. You know, uh, another thing was that uh, online, like somebody, my colleague, I think my friend uh, Marwan said, uh, online was also to have for us, but now it has gone to a level where uh, it has to be a primary focus for us, all of us. The pandemic has literally shook us, you know. We were really pushed to corner. At Lulu, in fact, we had invested quite heavily in building our e-commerce platforms, IT support apps, building and building a fleet of world-class customized vehicles for delivery as and business was scaling. But with the unprecedented surge in online traffic, almost I think five to ten times the usual traffic, it was becoming a huge challenge. We had to look out to scale quicker and deliver quickly. So, you know, in fact suddenly we started looking out to other partners you know we tied up with zomato we tied up with uber and kareem now we tied up with uh, rta dubai taxi to do more home deliveries brought in bike uh, bike fleet operators to launch express delivery of essentials to reduce the pressure on our websites you know that was getting huge number of hits so we we started talking with whatsapp directly in fact we launched as we talk uh, a couple of days back we launched uh, whatsapp automated uh, online ordering through WhatsApp, you know, uh, from being a self-operated business model, suddenly we were now looking to become a multi-partner e-com player. Uh, we introduced uh, more self-checkouts for contactless shopping. We introduced uh, drive-through facilities, you know, uh, so customers can order from online at home and then just drive through, go to our store, doesn't, doesn't have to go enter, enter the store itself go to the uh, checkout counter, uh, drive through counter at the parking, pick up their orders and in movements, they're back to home. Much has been done, you know, must say, but a lot more needs to be done. So let's hope that we all join together. I think uh, like a uh, lot of brands have come together in the communication also, leaving aside the competition. They were talking in the same language of joining hands, being partners, being stakeholders. That's what the need of the hour is. I think we all should join together to overcome this uh, situation. Surely, surely. And um, after initial uh, crisis management, of course, the focus is now rewiring uh, businesses, business operations, realigning goals. Um, you know, it could be omni-channel, it could be contactless, readjusting supply chain, uh, rethinking restaurant layouts so many things to consider. Uh, Timothy, can we begin uh, with your thoughts on um, whether reasons for consumers to visit shopping malls and for retailers to exist in shopping malls uh, change drastically? As a shopping mall, what kind of uh, rewiring are you undertaking? Uh, is it digitalization? Uh, is it uh, you know, upping the entertainment game? What is it really? You know, I, I think it was, you know, Marwan had stated earlier, malls have really become a big part of the social fabric. Uh, it's, it's not just shopping. Shopping used to be more necessity, now it's leisure. 
And uh, we're confident that people still want to find enjoyment with friends and families and be someplace that's exciting and compelling uh, where they can buy things, they can enjoy things. Uh, we were already in, in malls. And there's been a lot of discussion about it. We were already in malls looking to the future as to how do you go from mostly a transactional property to one that really addresses a lot of other needs, such as entertainment experience. Uh, so we were already in that process. And I, and I think what's been talked about already uh, by many uh, of the colleagues today is you, you have to look at accelerating really what you're already doing. Uh, you have to, so, so I think what, what happens is we have to move faster into you know, these experiential, these, these more entertainment food has to be even more dynamic, all types of elements from sit down to takeaway to delivery to gourmet, uh, you know, all that has to be looked at. Uh, some, of the, some of the base fundamentals that we have that, that we're gonna be taking a look at is number one, we did go from our primary communication with our customers within our property. I mean, in any given day, you walk in a mall, there's 100,000 people. So we have them captive, we can communicate with them. Uh, once the mall is closed, we couldn't communicate. So very quickly, as been discussed, we accelerated our digital engagement. Well, we already had 3 million followers uh, throughout various platforms that we have. We have 80 million customers. Uh, so really, when you look at rewiring, and you look at digital, we have to better link up, in my opinion, the mall brand. So we're, we're a festival city brand. And what does that mean from an experiential and from a retail to our retailers in their transactions? So to the extent you're going to e-commerce platforms, we also want people to be able to maneuver through those platforms saying, look, I know that Festival City has these stores. How do I link up to what the merchandise, uh, you know, opportunities are, the, 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 you know, the click and pick up type opportunities? Uh, how can the mall reward people who go through those platforms? Loyalty and reward programs, I think, will really uh, come in play uh, in order to continue to help facilitate. So it used to be our biggest issues. You know, we have websites and, and we stay engaged uh, with our customers through websites and through uh, Instagram and Twitter and all that. But it was more informational. Here's what's happening. Come and see us. I think what you'll see us transform into uh, from a digital standpoint is we want to facilitate as much as we can that transaction with the retailer, with the theater, uh, with the entertainment venue. How, how can we help better link that? and help complement what they're doing because we they have their identity as the retailer. We have our identity as the mall being with the retailer. So how do we better link this? So I think you'll see a lot of acceleration. As far as the physical design and the physical aspects, it, it's very difficult to sit in a time of fear and anxiety and say what's gonna happen a year from now. So we can say today, oh, everything's gonna be social distance by this level or this level restaurants are going to change, this is going to change. We're really dealing with a customer right now, up until recently, was told to stay home. You know, they didn't have a choice. So it's hard to make long-term judgments. And, and we're open now, uh, but we're only at 30% capacity because we're limited to that and we have a lot of restrictions. So what we're going to do is make sure that we understand what the patterns what shifting of patterns we see that are more permanent. And certainly we'll, we'll do what we need to do in the short term, but, but I, it's a little early for us to make long-term judgments. In other words, let, let's just say, if I were designing a new mall today, which we are designing a couple of new malls today uh, in, in some markets to look at expanding, I, at this time, wouldn't make any major changes in that design right now because I don't know really what the long-term implications are. Maybe you make the common areas bigger, maybe you know you provide uh, more outdoor seating and, and, and seating that spills out because you can spread seating. But I think it's a little bit early to tell at this point, uh, other than to make sure that in the short term and intermediate terms that we're looking out for the safety of our shoppers and looking out for uh, the viability and uh, uh, for our retailers. Uh, but, with that said, on the digital side, uh, I, I expect us to accelerate everything we were contemplating uh, and also 
uh, make sure that we can stay engaged uh, very, very closely with our customers, whether they're in our facility or not, where our main focus before was to engage the customers that were already within the facility. All right, thank you. Um, of course, uh, nature of brick and mortar is changing. And uh, this is also a question from one of our um, attendees, Saeed uh, from Umdash. Uh, my question would be again to both Mark and Marwan. How do you see your brick and mortar store changing while rewiring your businesses? And uh, speakers, if you could please allow me to make a quick announcement. We are uh, going to extend the webinar by 15 more minutes. We are having a wonderful discussion here and we do not want to cut this short. Okay, if, if I may start allow me. Um, yes. I would say uh, it's, been, it's been probably a year that we've set a strategy where we said our stores should be much more fun, entertaining, and as such, uh, as retailers, um, I would say our mission now is to make those stores um, bigger, better, uh, more tech uh, uh, enabled. So it's an experience. Uh, so I, I totally agree with Timothy. I, I don't believe there would be a major, major shift in, uh, in you know, in the future of, of malls as much as it's going to be a lot about adding more entertainment, adding more, uh, I would say, uh, fun, fun factors in malls. And this is exactly what we as a retailer are planning to do. So it's been a year for, for those who have attended the investment calls with us. We have said we want to turn the company in, into a lifestyle company. And what I mean by that, and because some of the attendees has uh, asked a question about consolidation, what I mean is that during these days, the big, the big fish are going to continue. Zara will become bigger and stronger, and maybe others might disappear. And actually, maybe the mall, and only Timothy can answer that, doesn't want to see except a great Zara rather than two, three lesser important brands. What I'm saying is that we're going to move towards a better, closer partnership with more developers. We need them to survive and they need us to survive. I believe more than ever, it's not about negotiating. It's about partnering up because the, the whole ecosystem is under pressure. From our part, we're going to invest a lot in bringing up those stores. So yes, investing more in existing stores to make them even more relevant rather than growing for the sake of growth. And I guess this would be the fundamental change, what I called before uh, shifting our uh, capex or investment strategy. All right. You want to, you wanna, let me put it this way, uh, sorry. You want to make those relevant malls even better. All right. Mark? Uh, well, from um, from my perspective, I think it's 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 very clear. I mean, um, I've, I've spoken about this a few times, but the population densities in the Middle East are quite low in reality. Um, so, if you look at the statistics of you know the amount of retail space, the amount of GLA that we've got per capita, there's way too much space. Um, there's just no no doubt about that. With all the new malls that keep coming on stream, then um, you know the customers want to go to the nice, bright, new, shiny thing. Um, and what you're going to end up with, I think, is quite a lot of secondary um, retail space. Now, retailers, this uh, crisis is a, a great example where retailers are just going to become far more choosy about what they're going to do. You know, they're just not going to build it, and they will come. It may well not happen for the retailers. It may well happen for the customers. So I think retailers are going to be far more uh, choosy. The discretionary spend on capex and things is going to become very important. I think the whole digital piece is going to play a major role with that, um, as um, the you know the Middle East landscape for digital is uh, developing. It, it definitely does not need to develop and look like it did ten and fifteen years ago elsewhere in the world. It needs to be fit for purpose for this market, and I think. Um, you know, whilst we were quite slow doing some of the stuff from a, a digital perspective, we're trying to make it more fit for purpose for the local uh, local market. I mean, the other thing that's interesting is if you look at what's happened, everyone's talking about this exponential growth at the moment in uh, digital sales, which is fine, but the infrastructure on deliveries has failed terribly because you know it's taken on average about 14 days to get a, to get a delivery from some of the big players, whereas uh, and that's that's now you know if you look at Amazon, they're saying. The, you know, 14 days or whatever, they just cannot deliver in time. So there's frailties in the model and the models need to be developed and uh, to be fit for purpose. They just have to be that. 
I think there's an interesting knock-on effect for the, the shopping malls because if you're trying to develop an e-com business where you've got um, click and collect, for example, then, uh, for example, our strategy will, will be more about making what I would call small stores large. So it means trying to give a smaller footprint store a large store offer. Now, if you think about what's happened around the rest of the world, then some retailers have started to do exactly that and they end up with smaller footprints for their brands because you can go into a store, look digitally at the things that you want to buy and then have it either delivered to the store or delivered it to your home. But that item doesn't necessarily have to be on display in the store. So making small stores large, broadening the offer. People will always want to go to a shopping mall in the Middle East. It's part, everybody's talked about it so far today. It's part of the social DNA. And again, statistically, elsewhere in the world, people go to shopping malls four times a year. The Middle East and the broader Middle East, nine stroke, 10 times a year. You know, it's a completely different dynamic, completely different dynamic. So um, I think individual retailers will have their own individual strategies by brand, of course. I think if some have got lofty ambitions, you know, it's not uncommon now to see, you know, brands with 50% of their total sales coming from uh, e-commerce and so on and so forth. My concern about what we've got going on here in the Middle East at the minute is that the infrastructures do not allow those numbers to be realistic. So, and that this yes. pandemic has proven that. So I think if people are really going to invest and they're very serious about it, I think the, the wise thing would be to, first of all, pause for breath. I think pause for breath and think, very carefully about which strategy is going to serve each individual brand and overall business well. Look at your priorities because there's a number of priorities that may well have been number one, you know, in January and February, but now there might be 101. So different priorities will now be important, I think, for most brands. If you focus as well and you make um, brave decisions and you're still prepared to innovate, then there will always be uh, an upside, I think, for those that are the first movers with those initiatives. I think that's what tends to happen. And I think this whole digital piece will, um, will, will, will be at the forefront of that. But, and then I think the other thing that a lot of retailers will be thinking about at the moment is they'll be thinking about minimizing risk. Because if you think about what's happening at the moment, there, there are so many restrictions on being brave and innovating at the moment because it seems to be counterintuitive. And I think there could also be another power broker in the room. The other power broker in the room at the moment will be the banks. So the banks uh, have a big role to play. Um, yes. and we're having daily conversations with our banks to make sure that they can support us through, through these difficult times. Um, and you know, there's some banks, if you read the newspapers, have become under serious pressure themselves. So the whole liquidity in the market to be able to want to operate and run properly whilst doing the right things I think means that you know businesses will have to be extremely focused on uh, on executing their plan, but it won't be it won't be straightforward. You know, there are so many complex factors in there, but I, trust me, I think the banks will be a, a new power broker in the room for many retail businesses, not only in survival mode but in development and growth. Sure, thank you, um, Nanda Kumar. We'll move on to you and hear uh, your thoughts first on um, if you are ramping up your uh, last mile delivery uh, facilities um, and also what about uh, contactless uh, facilities? This is also a question from uh, our attendee, um, Ashish Punjabi, COO Jackie's Retail. Could you uh, please unmute yourself? I, Thank I, you. Thanks, Ashish, for asking that question. Um, obviously, like uh, all of my co-panelists said now, very, very challenging times. Uh, never been a better time to ramp up your uh, online offering, your IT platforms, uh, contactless at, at our place. Like I was saying that we were, we were working through this whole uh, pandemic outbreak and continue to do so. Uh, the learnings have been that people are, people are really concerned. Uh, more concern for themselves and for their family. So obviously every option of contactless payment has to be uh, looked into. We have, we have at our Lulu hypermarkets, we have, uh, we already had started some time back and, but now we are fast tracked it to all the stores. Almost all the stores have an option of contactless payment, self checkout counters, click and collect. Like some of my colleagues said now is a, is a major thirst area for us. Uh, like as earlier mentioned, about our last mile delivery 
no more going to be just us for ourselves. Uh, I think uh, uh, we have been uh, forced to look for new partners and that's what most of them are doing. Lulu Group as well as other players in the market have been tying up with uh, different agencies and fleet owners and uh, food delivery apps and they're doing an amazing job. You know, it's taking the pressure off from the online uh, traffic which is surging every day. Uh, new entrants are coming up. Uh, they are also helping the a whole situation situation get better but i i like to quickly uh, share a small slide to just build the confidence we sure. recently uh, did a uh, uh, study with uh, uh, ac nielsen to to know more about uh, our uh, online business affairs is going to and that's what it has come to that it has some very i hope you can see this somebody can see that yes we can see this <laughs> This is, uh, I'm just adding a couple of slides, not many. Uh, this is a study done uh, in partnership with us also by AC Nielsen. Very latest figure, no way claiming to be the perfect scenario, but look at that. What, did, what this slide says is that, uh, you know, in terms of risk of spreading, Gulf market is optimistic, means the, the risk of spreading around the world is much higher compared to, compared to Gulf nations. Good plus point. Another plus point is that, most of the uh, people surveyed in KS and UAE think that current situation is a short term situation. If you look at that, the light blue and the next light blue colors mean that people are looking for three months to 12 months is what they're perceiving the situation to improve or at least come near the normal. So another plus point and in absence of any other reliable data or study, this could serve as a good pointer for what we can look forward to. Uh, Again, compared to the global scenario, uh, people here in Gulf are expecting things to be normal at least in 3.3 3 months compared to the global uh, benchmark of say roughly 5 to 6 months. Another plus point for us, another plus point for retail industry to, to plan better and, and ramp up their periods, but at least the consumer sentiments is geared towards making it faster. So these are some of the, some of the key pointers what we can take forward like uh, many of my panelists said that we have to relook at the way we do business it can be procurement it can be the product mix it can be the way we lay out our stores anymore what kind of products people are looking at even the service providers have to have to look at the way they are doing business with us i'm sure like i said like my colleague from oman uh, joji was mentioning the other day uh, the only things only certainty is now uncertainty you know with all these figures and facts we're talking now, let's hope things better get better quicker than later, and and we are able to do uh, everything possible to come up with solutions. Sure, thank you for sharing those slides. Really good uh, insights there, um, and very optimistic. Thank you, Naim. Uh, we will quickly ask you uh, your thoughts on uh, rethinking layouts of restaurants and whether you think reservations will be. Um, a norm going forward for some time? I think uh, planning, uh, floor plans, seating capacities, reservations, all of these um, will, will take place short, medium. Uh, long term, I think the, the human race, we, we're a social beast generally. So I think as long as there is a, a solution, a vaccine found, uh, and the writings on the wall clearly saying that we're getting out of this uh, pandemic, People will, forget, will forgive and forget and want to resume living life as we know it well. And I think our, our responsibilities as, as investors, operators, uh, retailers, we, we need to be nimble. We need to be agile. Uh, we need to be very well connected to what's happening. We, we can't plan 6, 12, 18 months ahead anymore. We need to be a lot faster. Uh, and, and last but not least, we need to give people the theatre impact. We need to give them the social engagement value for money and the service um, in order to get them back into our venues, uh, the first service they deserve. Uh, we, we have a, a massive job to work on social confidence to get people back and, um, and, and gain their confidence again. And not forgetting that 50%, 40 to 50% of, of the food and beverage industry will not see the operations again, will not be able to survive this pandemic. This is a very fundamental issue to the industry, um, particularly not forgetting that the airline the main market feeder is actually totally off, off grid. Sure. 
Thank you, Anne. Um, we will have to wrap up our discussion, but not before we've addressed at least, uh, you know, two questions. Uh, and I'll be very quick with that one. Um, how we haven't yet addressed rent relief. Alphotem uh, malls were the first uh, shopping malls to announce rent relief. Uh, how has that worked? And is rent relief enough? Second part of my question will be, uh, what do you see as a new normal for your business? Starting with you, Timothy. Uh, as far as rent relief, uh, Alpha Tame Group is also a retailer. Uh, we own malls, we're a retailer, we're not a businesses. So uh, we very much understood uh, that the ramifications of what was happening back in March uh, were not just a one month, you know, six week situation. Uh, so right away we came out uh, with a program to administer three months of rent credits to eligible uh, retailers, eligibility meaning uh, we're in good standing uh, on all of our outstanding issues. So uh, quite frankly, it's it's not as easy as it sounds to get three months rent credit uh, because there's a lot of documentation, legal work and discussions and so on and so forth, but we have been very successful. Uh, so those rent credits extended from April, May and June to the end of June. Uh, after that, we just have to really take a look at the business, be flexible. Uh, we certainly look at this as, as a partnership. We're not successful without successful retailers. Uh, so we'll be, we'll be sensible in our approach in the future. Uh, but we, we also ask that the other stakeholders be sensible as well. So, uh, so, so beyond that, we just have to wait and see. Uh, and uh, probably uh, after three months, it'll be more of a case by case type situation and a category by category of business uh, rather than giving universal. Uh, and what, what was the second question real quick? I'll be real quick to answer it. New normal for your business. Uh, the, the new normal, uh, we don't have a new normal yet. I think it was said, look, we have to really look at the short term and, and do be very agile and do what we need to do in the short term. Uh, and get beyond the the fear and the anxiety and the actual uh, the actual negative uh, results or the actual negative implications of the pandemic. So I think once we get past that, uh, we'll be able to understand how we get better and stronger. Uh, but really, right now, our focus is on the next three to six months uh, to continue with as strong of a product as we can possibly put forth with as much support for our customers and our retailers. Thank you. Can we hear your thoughts, Mark? Uh, yes, I, mean, I think um, the rent relief is always welcome. And obviously we're, we've got some very strong partnerships with our landlords. I think the interesting thing has been the dynamic and the differences between the individual landlords. Some people have been quite early and quite bold with their statements. Some people still haven't made you know, any comment in terms of how they will be uh, supporting or not as the case may be. I think some people are waiting for government um, legislation to say this is what the government stimulus may or may well not be. Um, so I think we're still working it out to be quite uh, honest and I think there are other things all thrown in the mix as well things like you know uh, lease renewals that are very prevalent at the moment and I think as long as everybody's treated fairly and equally um, and um, you know we're, not, we're making sure that they're not all the bigger players are being supported first at the expense of some of the smaller retailers. The last thing I think anybody wants to see is some of the smaller retailers going out of business because they're not supported by uh, some of the landlords. Um, because otherwise all the shopping malls, they, I mean, they look pretty much the same as it is. You don't really want them to be a bland array of uh, all the same brands some half a mile apart, you know, because that's definitely not what, what we want to see uh, at all. Um, but I think critical, critically will be this government relief piece. It will be understanding what people think, what even the landlords themselves may well get in terms of relief, because if they get any relief, then that will surely be passed on to individual retailers, but it's got to be done on an equal and uh, fair uh, basis. In terms of the new normal for us as a business, I think, well, I think retailing has always been dynamic. I mean, I've been in this game a long, long time, and it's probably one of the most progressive and innovative uh, industries, I think, around. You have to be fast enough to change to your consumer dynamics. So I don't think that's ever gonna change. I think what will change for many companies is that many companies will be leaner, without a doubt. Um, 
and hopefully I think sharper and faster. And in our case, I think we've we've definitely got to think about some new initiatives that we probably thought were going to take maybe the next six, nine or 12 months to do. And there's no doubt about it that we've got to do them in the next three to six months, because if we don't affect those, then I think we won't be agile enough to um, you know, embrace some of the uh, new opportunities. And there will be some, there will definitely be opportunities that come, ar come around. We just need to make sure that we're in uh, the right place to, be able to maximize those. Thank you. Moving over to you, Marwan. Yeah, um, to answer the first question when it comes to malls, I guess, first of all, um, uh, I agree that uh, a lot of landlords have already given support. Um, I truly believe that a lot are going to give uh, no rent uh, during the lockdown period. The, the, the challenge and the discussion will be all about after that. I would say it would only be fair, and uh, I can say that because I don't have stores in Dubai. I guess the, the memo I saw from, from Dubai Mall was a fair one, where you share the risks, and that's based on your OCR rate. Uh, going forward, uh, I don't know when. Uh, it will be very difficult for both parties to agree when will basic rent go back into the game, and if it ever will go back, and at what levels, because it's going to be all about when, when, when do sales come back to be at normal level. So it's going to be interesting to see how it will play. Again, I totally, uh, I totally agree with Mark is that um, I think it, it differs by, uh, by tenant. There are the big players who are going to probably push more, who are going to extend some of their leases, maybe renovate the stores in return of uh, rent reliefs. And there are a lot of formulas that I'm, I'm, I'm sure Timothy is the expert at. Um, I, I, am, I, I really support what, what, what you just mentioned that uh, I'm worried about the small tenants. And again, that would be another challenge for landlords. I believe there will be some empty spaces to fill uh, and that would be a challenge going forward. Um, so to, to, to answer you about the new normal, uh, I guess two things. First, online is no more a threat. We used to think of it as, as a threat. I think now it's an opportunity. It's probably the opportunity that pulled us out of this crisis uh, the last six weeks. Uh, so uh, it's going to be all about exploring, learning, uh, being agile, as Mark mentioned, and a lot about doing more with less. And I mean by that, doing more with less stores, maybe doing more with less brands and more relevant brand, doing more and sadly, maybe with less people on the ground. So it's going to be challenging times, but uh, um, it would be interesting to see, uh, you know, how, how it ends up to be. Surely, surely very interesting times ahead. Naim, what are your thoughts on both? Yeah, uh, look, I, I don't think the solutions with any particular stakeholder only, not the landlord, not the banks. I think everybody needs to shoulder their responsibilities. And I think if, if I take my own P&Ls and I look at them, dissect them, the biggest entry is rent. So I think that's a starting point that any business uh, entrepreneurs looking at the, at the moment saying, how do I alleviate that, that issue? Uh, I think whilst closing, I think there's, there's no possibilities of paying rent. There's no income. So principally, the venues that we have are not fit for purpose legally because uh, we can't operate. Um, but uh, it's the, the catch is once you start operating again, once you reopen and once you're running with capacities and, and, and limitations, uh, how do you work with landlords? How do you work with financial institutions in order to gradually um, reassume the, the, the rent? But until such a time, I think we're 12 months away. And I think, again, um, we, we need to make sure that transparency, unity uh, prevails in order to make sure that everyone gets a fair crack at survival more than anything else. New norm. Look, I think what, what COVID has done for all industries, it's it's fast forwarded a lot of the initiatives that we were doing. Um, I don't think there was any surprises online, uh, deliveries, aggregators. Uh, all we had to do is, is really just fast forward the approach and make it happen. Um, so maybe now we need to go back a bit and, and make sure that, that the foundation is very set. It's, it's, it works for both parties and, and clear. Um, and, and last but not least, which you know I, I didn't hear any mention of on the call is, we need to own the communication with our audience. I think there, there, was a, there was a massive gap between a lot of the retailers and their audience. Um, luckily in, the, in our business, on, on the food and beverage and hospitality front, we deal directly with them. So we, we own their, their details, they, they, they use us as, as end users. So there's no, no in between. Um, and I think it's, it's proven to be very powerful for, for us in this 
um, times because we reached out directly and they vice versa reached out directly. So the communication factor and, and making sure that engagement is, is um, at the forefront at all time. Sure, thank you. Uh, Nanda Kumar, what are your thoughts on new normal for your business? Yeah, uh, obviously, uh, you know, though we are predominantly a hypermarket grocery uh, player, but we also operate a large number of uh, shopping malls and uh, properties. And uh, as, as all my colleagues have said now, yes, we are always standing up with our tenants and other stakeholders to make sure that the, the, the risks or the hazard, uh, whatever issues we have on the rental side is mitigated to the maximum. And we are working close with all the stakeholders. Coming to the uh, grocery supermarket segment, obviously health and hygiene is going to the new mantra. We have to build these safety, health safety ethos strongly into all aspects of operation, whether it's uh, especially uh, for a player like us who have uh, who have to deal with huge number of staff and huge number of customer at any point of time, the, the safety and health takes a totally different and higher dimension. So in fact, and I was just telling the other day, uh, we have we have the non new norm for us. We have a totally uh, fully equipped uh, two separate buildings uh, for so-called uh, quarantining our staff with slightest of symptoms. You know, okay. quarantine doesn't mean in in, in in a negative term in the sense that the the building so that which is totally equipped with latest uh, medical facilities. In fact, there are doctors in place in the same building so that any staff with any slightest symptoms are moved there. They're taken care of. So the rest of the staff, they themselves, rest of the staff and the customers are protected. These are the new norms, you know, going forward till the vaccination or a cure is found, we have to deal with this. And the best way we can do is, is to take these challenges head on and, and equip ourselves every day. And, and needless to say, uh, contactless payment, uh, online shopping uh, experiences, in-store, uh, the you know, with, with the, the incomes going down or there are some kind of salary reduction going in the market. So we'll have to look at coming out with promotions and value packs, which are in bigger size so that fewer trips are made, but they take home a bigger and better valuable product. Each time they come, uh, there are many more things to do, but I'm sure these are the starting with and, and let's hope when we meet maybe in three months time from now, we can have something new and better to talk. Thank you. Rupa. Absolutely. Thank you so much for sharing such great insights. We have some amazing questions from our audience, which we are unfortunately not able to take uh, right away, but we will share all of these with our panelists here and revert to you all. Uh, thank you so much once again, such uh, thank you for your time, patience, sharing uh, such wonderful insights. Before handing over to uh, Justina, uh, I'll just take a couple of seconds to thank our frontline workers, healthcare, retail, delivery personnel, governmental agencies, non-governmental organizations. Thank you, big thank you for keeping us safe. Thank you, Roop. Thank you, panelists and Roop. Um, this was an amazing discussion. I think you all have shared immense knowledge with all of us. We are grateful. And on behalf of the entire team at Images Retail Middle East, we thank you. Please stay safe. And until our next round table, we shall see each other again. Thank you. Ramadan Kareem to all. Ramadan Kareem. Thank you. <laughs>